Well, good morning, Pillar Church. Pastor Canaan here. Uh, we're going to continue uh, in our series in the book of John. You can put the John one on now. There you go. Uh, we're going to continue in our, book, in our series in the, in the Gospel of John. So go ahead and open there in your copy of God's Word. The series is called That You May Believe. For those of you who don't have a Bible, we will have the verses on the screen. But I highly encourage you to have your own copy of God's Word in case you want to underline or write something for your own health and growth. I want, to, I want you to lay your eyes on the theme of the Gospel of John. And it's found in John chapter 20, verse 30 through 31. And listen to these words carefully. This is the very reason why John wrote this letter. He said, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. So in other words, there's a lot of things that John saw Jesus do. A lot of things that John saw Jesus and heard Jesus say, okay, that he didn't write. Why? These things, these are written. These selected stories, narratives, happenings, accounts of Jesus that I wrote down, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. His goal through writing what he wrote is that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by reading what he wrote, his selected accounts of Jesus, you would have life in his name. That is my prayer for you. That's my prayer for me. My prayer for me, I'll let you in on this, is that God shows me the areas of unbelief within me. I've given my life to Christ, but this is what we do. We have areas that we don't want him to mess with. We try to keep that far from, far from our prayer list, far from our, I want to change that list. Try to ignore it. That's not life. That's bondage. John wants us to have life. And if we would behold the person of Jesus, who he is and what he's done, we can relinquish those areas of unbelief to him safely, freely, and let him do whatever he wants to do in his divine mind to do with it. This is his goal. This is the goal of the Gospel of John. Last Sunday, the Apostle taught us as of first importance that Jesus a.k.a. the Word, is God. This is what he opens his letter with. This is what he says. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. John's mission, right off rip, is to tether our faith to the identity of the person of Jesus, namely, that the word was God. That's what he starts it off with. That's the most important thing for him right now. He says, I want you to have life. And the first thing I'm going to tell you is that in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. If you remember in that sermon on February 19th called In the Beginning, there were two concepts that I taught you in greater depth then, so if you want to hear the more explanation of it, you can look there. But there were two, what we called, different types of attributes that John ascribes to Jesus. The first concept of, or, or grouping of attributes is called incommunicable attributes. Incommunicable attributes are qualities we cannot share with God. As people, as his creation, we innately don't have those things about God that God only can have. Last Sunday, it was, or two Sundays ago, it was his eternality, right? The fact that he's eternal. We are not eternal. We have a beginning point. We may be everlasting. We have life in his name, life everlasting. But we had a beginning point. God alone is eternal. And that's to be juxtaposed against another category of attributes called communicable attributes. These are attributes that God does share with his creation. The ability to love, the ability and concept of understanding justice. Those are communicable attributes, things that God gave us in our person and being. 
The incommunicable attribute that John ascribes to Jesus last week was eternality, that Jesus has no beginning and no end. In fact, Jesus says this of himself in the book of Revelation. Jesus tells, says of himself, he says, I am already, he's starting off, watch when we get there in John 8. Ooh, that's a big, t- that's, he's saying something with those first words. But he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. This is what Jesus, this is how Jesus designate, designates himself. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the first and the last. Moses also wrote a psalm, if you didn't know that. He wrote Psalm 90. And he wrote something interesting about God. He said, before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, here it is, from eternity to eternity, you are God. What is that teaching us? It's teaching us that God never developed into his godness. He always was. It's teaching us that God always existed, and that is a concept that the human mind does not have the capacity to truly grasp with honesty. We understand it at one level, but at a a completely different level, we have no idea what that means. Right? Can we just, it's okay to not understand things about God. God's God. There's aspects of him that we'll never fully grasp, but we got to allow him to say who he is and just say, okay, God, that's too wonderful for me. We can't think back into eternity because it's, to eternity. It just doesn't go back anymore. But when we couple what Jesus says about himself and what Moses writes about God, when we couple that with John 1, 1 and 2, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. It means from eternity to eternity, Jesus was with God and is God, according to the Apostle John, which means that Jesus never developed into God either. Jesus always was with God and Jesus always was God. The reason why the Apostle John is anchoring us to the person, uh, to, the, to the deity of Christ is because our very salvation hangs in the balance. He, he writes it first on purpose. This is not to negate or neglect or not mention the fact that Jesus is also 100% man. He's a man. He was born in Bethlehem. God entered into his own creation and was born there. But there's something that transcends his birth, and that's his deity. The fact that Jesus is God, and no one should be able to sway you. And if they try, simply allow them to read John's defense of who the person of Jesus is in John 1, 1 and 1, 2. In our text this morning, the Apostle John is about to ascribe Jesus another incommunicable attribute. What's incommunicable attribute mean? Y'all were scared, though. Y'all were scared to say it. Y'all were like, (laughs) an attribute, a characteristic, a quality of God that Mankind, because we are created, cannot share with God. It's not ours. He has this. He's about to give him another one. And he's about to ascribe him something called creatorship. Creatorship is the next one. Look at our, ver- our verse this morning, verse 3. John said, all things were created through him. This, this him is Jesus, by the way. And apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. Several months ago, my mother came to visit from out of town, and that's always a good time for me and my wife because we get to sneak off for a date and leave the kids with her. If y'all got mothers that do that, praise you mothers. We love you. If you've been the beneficiary, congratulations. Go do it again and again. And uh, there was a night where we were sitting in my living room. I have a small glass table in my living room. Kids are around the glass table, and they're doing Play-Doh or something like that. And at some point, while me, my mother, and my wife are all sitting there and we're all talking, my kids do something, do something crazy. Because you know kids, they be crazy, right? So they did something crazy, and I took one off to the side, and I disciplined my child. That's a kind way of saying I spanked her, okay? That's what I do. I did that. I spanked her. I brought her back in the room, and she, you know, puffed up crying. And you know, what, what do grandmas do? Come here, baby, right? Sits her on the lap. Now, already I'm like, you're reversing my punishment. What are you doing? But she's mama, so I let her do what she do. She got a little bit more juice than I got right now. So 
She brought her in, sat her on my lap, consoled her. It was nice. It was beautiful. And then she said, oh, poor baby. My, my mother said, I'll never forget it. She said, baby, you want me to spank daddy? <laughs> All my kids' heads turned around like. <laughs> and, then, and then my daughter, who was crying, that frown was like, whoo. And I was looking at her like, you better not say yes. But I, you know, I don't know what she's going to say. My oldest daughter looks at grandma, looks at me. And she's like, you could do that? That's literally her word. She, you can do that. And I'll never forget my mother's response. You guys have heard this response. She said, of course I can, baby. I made him. I brought him into this world. And I could take him out. And so I was like, oh, like in my head, I was just like, I'm so shocked that you would say something. I thought she was going to be like, of course I can. not No, she said this. Now, there's a degree in which that fun story will relate to our topic today. What I want you to do is just put a pin in that phrase that my, my, my mother said. I brought him into this world and I can take him out. Just put a pin in that for a second. As we turn our eyes back to the text. John starts off his, his, his verse, this verse three, with a statement and then he gives um, some categories under that statement. This is the first statement. He says, all things were created through him. Now, remember last week, we talked about John painting a picture, and he's painting a picture by drawing our eyes and our mind back to the very first verses of the Bible. You guys remember we talked about that? When he said these first words, he said, in the beginning, right? John starts off his gospel by saying, in the beginning. But that's where the commonalities stop, and that's where John begins to illustrate and illuminate who was in the beginning. He's, he's going to take us... He's gonna, He's going to take us on a little bit of a detour from where we think we're going. We read John 1.1 1, 1 and it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's what, we, that's what we see. But do you remember what John said about in the beginning? In the beginning was the word. Not, he didn't say God, he said the word. And then he said, in verse 3, all things were created through him. The him was the word. But in Genesis it says, in the beginning, God created. John is giving us teaching and instruction about the identity of this person, this Jesus of Nazareth. He's opening up something that is incomprehensible. This Jesus that you've touched and seen and heard teach, move around, this Jesus in the beginning, he always was. He's actually God. He's, he's trying to take away any argument to the contrary by initiating the conversation that he was eternal, and now he's saying he created all things. And he's using, he's taking a word play on the beginning book of the, of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. Now the Apostle John is hoping and knows that we've read more than the first four verses of the book of Genesis. He's actually banking on it. Because how does Genesis continue to describe God's act of creating the heavens and the earth. Do you remember? Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Then God said, let there be an expanse between the water, separating the water from the water. Then God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Then God said, let the earth produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit with its seed and according to its kinds, and it was so. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. There will serve as signs for seasons, days, and years. Then God said, let the water swarm. Y'all catching, catching a, a little vibe here? God's saying something. God said, let the water swarm with the, li with the living creatures and the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. Then God said, let the earth produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creature creatures that crawl, the wildlife of all different kinds. And it was so. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And they will rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the whole earth. What is God doing in these verses? He's 
creating. How is he creating? What's the refrain that I just said nine times, just about nine or ten times in this, in this chapter, depending on the manuscript you use? Nine or ten times. How did he do it? God said it. This is how the psalmist puts it. He said, the heavens were made by the word of the Lord and all the stars by the breath of his mouth. This is where we get the idea, if you might have heard this in Christian circles, that God spoke the universe into creation. You ever, you ever heard that? God, God spoke. This, this is where we get it. It says God said, God said, God said, God said. And then you have the psalmist talking about the breath, the breath of his mouth. But here's the problem. In our 21st century mind, the only concept we have of a word is for a word to literally be spoken out of a mouth. But that's not the case in the first century. In the first century, the term murma, which was the Aramaic word for word, which is logos in the Greek, that word comes with more body than just speaking. It was often personified. And it was personified and unified with the person who spoke it. So if my word came out of my mouth and affected something, I affected that thing. Not hard to understand. When God speaks and his word comes out of his mouth, his word is affecting, he's affecting that thing. But John is saying, hold on, I want to equate two things for you. Remember that word, that breath that came out of God's mouth? That breath is not just a breath, it's also a personification. It's somebody that did something. And I don't want you to miss who the somebody is. Beloved, I tried to look up what type of wordplay that was. And you know what I found? Nothing. I don't know. I didn't have time to find it. If you know, yell it out. I knew y'all didn't know. That's why I wasn't ashamed. That's why I wasn't ashamed. But he's, he's, he's creating a wordplay between the concept of Jesus being the word and Jesus being the creator because he knows that you read Genesis 1 and when God created, he spoke. What did he speak? His word. What does his word do? Create. Well, Jesus is the thing that he spoke, but he didn't really speak him because he's a person. Did I confuse you? Praise God. Because it's hard to understand and it's vastly more complex than what we're going to fully grasp. But understand that John is connecting the creative power of God with the person and work of who Jesus is. That's what he's trying to unite. That's what he's trying to, to put together. And he's also showing us that there's a harmony happening. He never renounces John 1.1 in the beginning Elohim, God. He never denounces that. That God created. He never says when the prophets say that Yahweh created, that's another name for God. When he created, he never says they got it wrong. He's like, no, they got it right. He's showing us that there's a plurality in the person of God. The verse says, this is the Apostle John writing, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse three, all things were created through him. What John wants us to not do is believe the lie that Jesus was some kind of a sidekick or contract worker in the work of creation. Because sometimes we tend to think that God created Jesus and then Jesus created everything else. That's an old school heresy from back in the day. That's not true, beloved. That's a lie on who Jesus is. In fact, how do I know it's a lie? Because John started his first verse to debunk the concept that Jesus was created in the first place by telling us that he is RK. He's eternal. He's from the beginning. I'm getting ahead of myself because I want to start doing exciting stuff in my head, but I got to stop. I've had conversations with people who say that, well, well, God created Jesus and Jesus created everything else because oftentimes in Scripture, you will see it says all things are made through him. That's not a lie either, but oftentimes what the authors are trying to do in the Scriptures is, is maintain a distinction between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit while maintaining their unity simultaneously. Super hard. Remember when I said a little bit ago that he makes a statement and then he makes categories. So the statement was all things were created through him. And now what John is going to do is going to make a verbal category chart table in his in our, in our head. And he says, apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. Let me help you with the category. Boom. 
Okay? This, this is helping. This is what John said. He literally just, this is, this is helping you understand this. John said, everything ever created without exception was created by Jesus. Everything goes in here. Except for God, right? Not created. Remember what John said. Everything that's ever been created without exception belongs in the created category. If Jesus was created, yet he created everything in the created category, how does he create himself and everything in there? Doesn't work, doesn't happen. He can't both be in the created category and the creator of the cate created category simultaneously. And that's why John starts off the gospel by saying this, in the beginning, arche, prior to creation is what that means. The point of origin, in the beginning was, the imperfect Greek tense always was, the word. Who's the word? Jesus. Before creation, the point of origin always was Jesus. That's what he's telling his people. Y'all see that? Then he says, the word was with God. Jesus, perfect, perfect tense, always was with God. And what? The word was what? Always God. So to take the concept that God created Jesus and that Jesus created everything else out of your mind, he starts by telling you, no, he just always was. He is the creator. This is what he did. Now, there's some technicalities in this. There's definite articles and stuff that we have to, to, to deal with and we've dealt with. There are plenty of times in the scriptures, this is an aside if you, if you want to talk about that. There's plenty of times where the, the definite article is before God and is speaking of Yahweh. Sometimes they try to say because it has a definite article before, before was or the word here, then it means that he was a separate God. But that's for you eggheads if you're trying to study it. In case you were confused, he follows it up with this. This is clearly telling you who Jesus is. He's with God and he was God. Plurality and unity at the same time. And in case you're confused... He also created everything. Jesus is the divine, eternal creator God that we see in Genesis 1. So now when you open up your Bible and you read Genesis chapter 1, instead of thinking some highfalutin somebody else, think the person and work of Jesus and the Father and the Spirit together creating. Because this is what the author is trying to tell us. In fact, you think John might be a little loopy? Paul said the same thing. They must all be crazy. Look what John said. Uh, Paul said. Paul said everything was created by him. And then he exhausts his own language to make sure it's clear. In heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things, how many things? All things have been created through him and for him. Now, now he goes, he is before all things. You can't get it shook or twisted. He makes it too clear. He's before everything. And by him, he holds all things together. This also dispels the idea that the universe is some random act of molecules that are imploding and exploding rapidly. Key word, random. Nothing in this universe is random. Nothing has ap happened by mistake. The universe this galaxy, the world, and everything, it is oozing with, the, with divine purpose and meaning. It was carefully and skillfully constructed by Jesus, the creator. And here's the beautiful reality of this. This is how we bring this to you. That includes you. You, beloved, are no cosmic accident. Can we just have a moment of reality? We all feel like a mess up at some times. Some of y'all may use other words. We feel like an accident. But I want you to know this morning that you were born in the divine mind of Jesus. You were carefully knit together in your mother's womb. Intentionally so. Look what the psalmist said. It was you, God, who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I'll praise you because I've been remarkably and wondrously made. Your works are wondrous. Who's his works? Us! What are we? We're wondrous. Let the text tell you what it was. And I know this very well. 
my fear is that we don't know this very well. My fear is that we've allowed expectations that somebody put on us to govern us rather than letting the word of God govern our souls and tell us who we are. We were created divinely, carefully knit together in the mind of Jesus by the word of God put together with purpose. We are not random. You are not a mistake. None of you are a mistake. Jesus knit you together on purpose. Just like my mother, beloved, he brought you into this world, but he didn't bring you into this world so that he could take you out. He brought you into this world that you may attain life. That's why you're here, so that you could feel your way toward the Savior. He put you in the circumstances that you're in on purpose. And the purpose is that you may feel your way. Okay. Let Luke tell us then. For the God who made the world, who made the world King Jesus, and the Father and the Spirit. Let's, let's, let's be clear. Who made the world and everything in it? He is Lord of heaven and earth. Does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives everyone life and breath in all things. From one man he has made every nationality to, to live over the whole earth. And has determined, check this out, you ready? And has determined their appointed times and boundaries of where they live. God put you where you are on purpose. Why? He did this so they may seek God. And perhaps they might reach out and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us. Your existence is no divine, is, is no cosmic accident. It's divine intentionality on the part of the Savior, Jesus Christ. He put you where you are for a reason. Find yourself in hard times? It's okay. It's all right. God is still sovereign. He has not fallen off the throne. What is he doing? No idea sometimes. You ever see the meme of the kid rolling down the slide and he just, ah! it's completely safe, but he has no idea. He feels like his life is over. And God's like, baby, there's a floor. You're going to land on the floor. It's, it's going to scoop you down. There's physics in this thing and it's going to whoop and you're going to be just fine. You're going to land on your little bottom. You're good. This God saying, I know that circumstances are crazy. I know it's hard. I know it's confusing. I know you don't know what to make of it. Or he's saying, I know everything is good. I know everything is awesome. I know I made you smart and intelligent and witty and, and, and able to influence. I know I gave you a wonderful family. I know, beloved, I didn't give you any family. I know these circumstances that you're in. Don't be puffed up and do not be dismayed. In both circumstances, remember me because your circumstance was built to draw you to me. Oh, that you may have life. If you're one of those people in the room who's feeling less than right now, you're feeling like a cosmic accident, you're fighting to recognize your worth and your value. If you're one of these people right now and you know who you are, who are battling with a, a sin that just will not leave you alone. I didn't say you wouldn't leave it alone. That's not the nature of sin. You can't just let it go. Sin has you. That's why you can't let it go. If you feel like sin is just, it's called ent being entangled in, in sin, a besetting sin. It just has you. It wrangles you. You try to run away and it just, its ropes just find you and pull you to itself. If you're one of those people who feel that and your sin is eating you alive emotionally or physically or mentally, I come to you with good news. There's a creator God named Jesus who sees you where you are right now and has not demoted you. There's a creator God named Jesus who's willing to enter into his own creation to rescue you from that. There's a creator God named Jesus who would sacrifice his very life to save you from that sin, to save you from God's wrath and to transform you from the inside out. There's a creator God named Jesus who would rise from the dead that you may have life in his name, not because you deserve it, beloved, but because he loves you. This creator God named Jesus desires that you have life. Next week, we'll define life more, but it's not less than this statement. Life is to know and be known by God.
we can say we know God, but when God knows us, it changes the game. Because we know that when we go before him, when our earthly time is expired, he won't say, depart from me, I never knew you. He'll say, come, beloved, come into the rest of your master, good and faithful servant. I know you. I love you. Broken you were, but redeemed you were. Because I remember when I took the nail for you. Some of you guys struggle with alcohol. You've been called a drunk. You've been called an idiot. You've been called can't get right. Low down, no good, dirty dog. Perhaps some of that is true to some degree. Maybe you are somebody who struggles with that. Maybe you are addicted to this thing called pornography that refuses to let you go. I come with good news for you. The same power that Jesus used to create this universe is the same power that Jesus uses to remake you. To set you free from that thing. So that those words no longer are the title above your head. It doesn't say uh, addiction. It says free in Christ. It says redeemed over your head now. And he has the power to do it. If he can create all things, beloved, he can make you into a new creation from the inside. In fact, he says, if anyone is in Christ, anybody, how many, what kind of person? Anyone. I don't care what you, what, what enslaved you in the past. Doesn't matter what they called you as a kid. None of that has hold on you. I don't care what's debilitating you. Anyone who's in Christ, you're a new creation. Here's the hard part, walking in the truth. That's the hard part. Because we're still letting their words define us instead of his word. I might have told you this story before. There was a dude growing up, we called him Big Joe. Big Joe was a big dude. He used to take about 150 pound dumbbells, just bing, 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 bing. And he was like, hey, Kenny, can you come spot me? And I'm like, can't hold that weight. That's all he had was the bing, bing, bing all day, right? Well, one day uh, we used to go, this is after we graduated from high school. Uh, we used to go to the high school gym to, to work out. Well, they were renovating the high school for about a year. A year went by, we go back to the gym and they had world-class state-of-the-art equipment in there for, for the football team, which meant it's for me because I'm ex-football team, right? So I get, you know, so me and Joe walk up in there and we're like, hoo, 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 hoo. look at all the stuff. Guess where Big Joe went? Right to the dumbbells. I think Big Joe's legs were about this big. <laughs> you see, Big Joe in the garage and in the old gym didn't have nothing to do with his, he had no weights for his leg, he had no weight, leg equipment. He couldn't do a leg press, leg curl, nothing. But his mind, even after being released to the freedom and the vastness of what that gym had to offer, that would give him all the plentiful exercise equipment he needed to work the bottom half of his body, chose still to go, what he, go with what he was used to because of how he's been conditioned to, I don't, I can't walk in that. I don't know what that is. Fearful of the freedom. Afraid of what's about to happen if he does a few leg presses on the Smith machine. But beloved, we don't have to fear. We don't have to be afraid. We're in Christ. And that old, that old us, dead. Don't resurrect it. Let it go. And see, the new has come. There's no more space for that guy. Beloved, that's not an overnight thing. For some of us, we, we kill sin is overnight, right? Some of us, to some, we're like, Lord, I need freedom. We fasted, we prayed, we woke up, and that mug was gone, not even the temptation. Praise God. Some of y'all sins, you need to bang with the anvil and the hammer for a while, right? It takes a while to get that mug off of you. That's called letting the word renew your mind day after day so that you are no longer walking in the realities and truth and, and passions of the old dead man. It just takes some time to get that stank off you. You got to scrub this week and next week, maybe a couple weeks. Every now and again, because of our, our long history in the world, that mug starts to creep back in our mind. And this is where you need God's people and God's word to help renew. And to, dare I say this, call you out on something. 
Don't be afraid of a call out. Remember, that warning is a, is a love language. I love you. Don't do that. But it all starts with this truth that we are in, we're in Christ. How do we get in Christ? By faith. You don't earn it. You don't be a good little boy. You entrust your heart, your mind, and your soul to the person of Jesus and say, on this day, I am yours, O Lord. How do you get there? Ask him to draw you to himself. Lord, I'm not really feeling I don't know. I know what he's saying is true. I just don't know where it is. God, help me. Help me. Show me. Open these eyes so that I can see, so I can experience that freedom of the new man. And then, if that doesn't help, allow the word to tell you what to do. Cry out to the Lord in your trouble. And what's his word do? His word saves them in their distress. He sent his word and healed them and rescued them from their traps. Just cry out to the I didn't make that up. This is right here. Cry out to the Lord in your trouble. And he'll save you from your distress. Or passage I didn't put in here, well, he'll change the disposition of your mind and you'll endure the hard time for a season to find freedom on the other side. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were created through him and apart from him was not one thing that was created that, was, that has been created. John is telling us this simple truth. There's power in the name of Jesus the Creator. Bow to it.